what we have here is buckwheat, and uh, buckwheat is, is really an interesting plant. It, it, we really don't have any close relatives to this plant that we grow. I mean, this is kind of it within the family. It's got some really unique characteristics. Um, of course, you can see all the blooms uh, from planting to bloom. Buckwheat gets there faster than any other. 30 days. I yeah. mean, it's one of the fastest plants there is from planting to bloom. Uh, the pollen and the nectar production is really impressive. A lot of people plant this as a, a honeybee food or a wild pollinator food. Um, it's also the pollen and nectar are very attractive to ladybugs, lacewings, surfeit flies. The larvae are able to eat the pollen and nectar as a prey substitute. So one of the reasons we like to plant buckwheat is as an attractor for predatory insects. Uh, we put this in with uh, summer sorghum mixes, brings in the, the ladybugs, lacewings, surfeit flies, and they will live off the pollen and nectar until aphids show up. And then they turn around and say, oh, fresh meat, let's go eat them. And so, this is a very good means of biological insect control, yeah. and, and at very low cost. I mean, 62 cents a pound, but we have it right now. Uh, a pound or two an acre, it's a lot cheaper than two sprays of Moveno at 25 bucks an acre apiece. And this, this particular plant is, just came up volunteer here in this sunflower patch, uh, but, but it brings up the point that if you're going to grow sunflowers for seed production, Buckwheat is a fantastic companion crop for all those reasons that you said to get some biological control of head moth and, and different other predatory uh, uh, bugs. But but it's a it's a really good companion crop. It grows fast uh, and just all those uh, flowering benefits. And then the other thing is is the root system uh, exudes a very strong acid that can help mobilize and make available phosphorus in the soil that other plants just can't get to. Yeah. And so it's a great plant if you've got, if you know you've got phosphorus in your soil, but you don't think maybe it's available. Yeah. And, you know, it's hardly an impressive root system in, until you see what it does in the following crop. And a lot of people who are long-term cover croppers who have put in plots like this, they plant over the top of it the following year, and they have this little strip that said, wow, what, what grew here the year before? And it was this little old buckwheat plant. It really does seem to stimulate the yields of the following yeah. plant. And for, probably for a lot of reasons we don't understand. It is not a mycorrhizal fungi host, which, which is kind of odd among plants. Uh, one of the few non-Braska crop plants that are not mycorrhizal host. And uh, when a plant does not host mycorrhizal fungi, it has to have evolved different nutrient uptake mechanisms. And so I think some of those uh, alternate nutrient uptake mechanisms, like the, the acid secretion, provide benefits to the following crop and rotation. I would never want to plant this as a monoculture because it does not host mycorrhizal no. fungi, but it's great in a blend. Always try to throw yeah. a pound or two of this in. And, and probably the biggest cautionary tale with buckwheat is it is because it blooms early, it's going to make seed. It'll probably be making viable seed six to seven weeks after planting. And so if you're going to have buckwheat in your cover crop mix, you just you just have to kind of know that it's going to make some seed. Like like this guy was a volunteer out here. Uh, you're going to see that. But even in organic situations where they can't chemically, and it's easy to chemically control. Yes. But even in organic situations, uh, we have a lot of organic guys that use buckwheat, and they just, it, it's not that big of a deal to have a little volunteer buckwheat popping up here and there. Uh, it's chemically controlled in a non-organic situation and it's not going to be overly competitive in an organic field.